Did we finish as I'm from the right? No. So we finish the inflation part. Okay, so if we, oh yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so that's sweet. So, so what I'm going to do is uh, first is uh, let's finish our uh, power notes number one. So once again, let's um, uh, review a little bit of uh, notes number one. So notes number one is as a part, this is the first part of the macroeconomics. And the uh, notes we, we mentioned is the first step to learn the overall macroeconomics is that we need to learn three, meaning three, meaning three, yeah, statistical numbers of a measuring like uh, uh, about those three policy goals. Recall those three policy goals, like what we need to do, what we want to do actually in microeconomics. Is this a government we want to promote, like encourage more production of Okay, because more, so basically fundamentally speaking, more production, more consumption. So we thought any production activities, how consume consumers can consume buy something. Okay, so more production, more consumption. So number two, what we want to do is a second policy goal of a macroeconomic policy. We want to keep the inflation rate low. Be more specific, keep the inflation rate under two percent annual annually data. Okay, annually inflation rate keeps yeah keep the rate under two percent. So we want, we want to stabilize the price level, okay? We don't want the general price level increases so fast, like about 2% 2 annually. So last week we mentioned you have so many different ways to explain why people don't like the general inflation rate. So it's, it's about 2%. Yeah, one way we can see is, oh, so because the people uh, need to see part of their current from for the future, right? For, for example, for the future retirement. Okay, so during a, if you live in an environment, macroeconomic environment, where the, in which the general inflation rate is so high, right? So, so your natural, naturally, your response is you want to see a bigger proportion of your current income for the future. Okay, because you know, because you are an anticipating that the, the the general price level, like a thirty years ago after you got retired, could be sky high. Okay, so to prepare for that, you need to save a bigger proportion for your current income of your current income for the future. And there's a third policy goal, like what we uh, Explain today, discuss it today is called the implement. Is something related to the implement? Okay, so it's about like whether or not people in a country really can find a job. Okay, so as a government, make sure you need to create like an in try your best, okay, to create more employment opportunities, right? And to allow the people in your country to find a job. So at least you can get some basic kind of income. Okay, so we just assume okay, for, for most ordinary people, okay, the source of income is, 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 is comes from the implement. Only you can find a job, super easy. Well, only you can find a job, and then you can make some money. So we saw the implement, so how you can, how you can make some money, right? So certainly, so whether people really can find a job is a very, very important issue, okay, in the micro -tons. So for measuring that, okay, we create, we calculate something called the amplitude rate. So let's see the formula. You kind of need to understand and memorize these things. These are formulas are called the amplitude rate. So one mistake people always uh, make is uh, uh, people think amplitude rate equals to the number of amplitude workers divided by the population source. Right, so people think the denominator here should be the population size, but it's a swamp. 
you see actually here, instead of a population size, we the term we use here is called a labor force. And the labor force is a totally different from population. Okay, so two different things. So labor force in the real life thing is actually is only part. Okay, it's only part. It's a, a fraction of the total population. So give me one moment, I need to open the door. <laughs> Okay, I'm back. Let's continue. Okay, what I mentioned is, okay, remember this. So the labor force is only part of the total population size. Okay, so if I draw a graph here, if I use this a bigger circle to represent the total population. Okay, so this is my total population size. Okay, so labor force only actually only is a part of the total population. So this part, like the smaller circle, is as a labor force. And this labor force is only part of the total population size. And how big is this fraction? Okay, how big is this little circle take care of the bigger circle? Is it called the labor force participation rate? Okay, it's called a labor force participation rate. So to calculate that, you just do a division, you just use the labor force, like this uh, smaller circle here divided by the bigger circle, divided by the total population. Okay, so the percentage, so the fraction is called labor force participation rate. Okay, and so among these labor forces, okay, the majority, normally speaking, the majority of the labor force should be employed workers. Okay, so there's a bigger proportion among this labor force in this little circle, the bigger proportion this is an employed workers. Okay, the small part, okay, like the shaded area. So this little part is the unemployed workers, representing the total the employed workers. Okay, so then you got the definition of an unemployment rate, right? Then you can calculate. Okay, so the unemployment rate actually is a, is a fraction, okay, so it's a proportion, the shaded area take care of the, the smaller circle. Is a called the unemployment rate. Okay, so now you got the two formulas. Okay, so one is called the employment rate, and the other one is called the labor force participation rate. And one more thing, one more thing we need to understand is why. Why is the labor force is a, is a kind of a smaller than the population? Why only part of the total population size can be called as a labor force? So why is the case? So uh, most of people, those are people you, uh, a few, uh, few guys can understand, okay? So those are young people, like a three years old baby, right? Can be contest part of a population, but for sure, certainly not, right? Can be, can be contest, can be contest a labor force because it, because it's just a three year baby, okay? Those are, those are people already got a tie retired. Okay, so these type of people, they can be, they, they are part of a population, but uh, isn't part of a labor force for sure. 
But the most important thing in the field of economics, like you, you remember this. So some people, they voluntarily quit the job. Some people, they don't want to find a job. They don't have a job, but they, they have been not actively thinking and implement for a while. They just don't want to find a job. They just voluntarily quit the labor force. Like, like for example, like, like uh, so called maybe stay home mom, right? They just want to take care of their maybe babies, children. They don't want to find a job by, by, by themselves. Okay, so these are kind of people, these are kind of uh, unemployed workers they cannot be counted as labor force. Okay, if you don't want to find a job. If you don't actively think and implement, if you don't have a job now, if you don't actively think in one, think and implement, okay, you cannot be counted as a part of, uh, of labor force. And this is uh, so important, okay? And after these two formulas, okay, AP, like the multiple choice questions, if you test your guess, something called as a type of unemployment. Okay, so totally we need to learn five types for the different categories of implement. So how we distinguish these five different types of implement? So based on the reason, remember this, okay, based on the reason, based on the reason why you want, why you cannot find a job. Okay, so totally we have five different uh, types, so-called categories. The first one can be called as a discouraged worker. Okay, also can be called as a hate implement. So number two, number B is a kind of structural implement, and the seasonal and the cyclical implement and the fractional implement. Okay, so totally five different types of implement. Okay, so let's go through them like one by one. Okay, so 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 all is about the reason, like why you cannot find a job. The first one, the first one, the first type of like kind of we have mentioned. Okay, so, so you don't you you don't want to find a job. You don't actively think and implement due to whatever the reason. Okay, due to whatever the reason, if you voluntarily, if you quit. As a, as, a, as, a, as a part of uh, as a part of labor force okay due to whatever the reason we don't care about what is the actually the reason is if you don't have a job but you don't actively think and implement like you don't attend those job affairs you don't send your resumes to potential employers if you don't do these things you cannot be contest the labor force okay so this kind of people also can be Called as a hidden implement. Now think about that. Why, why we call them a hidden implement? Because even the, 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 they aren't even part of the labor force. Right? If you don't actively think implement, we mentioned so many times, if you don't actively think implement, you even cannot be counted as a part of the labor force. Okay, so you cannot be included into the contest as a part of the officially released implement rate data, right? Because 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 you 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 even you you are you aren't even part of the labor force. They better we actually don't care, don't don't think much about what what, what is the reason. Okay, maybe you are a like we mentioned, maybe you are a stay home mom. You just want to take care of your. Okay? Like a baby, so children, whatever the reason, take good care about that. Like a, like a patient, if your family member get sick, whatever the reason. Okay. So, number B is a kind of structural implement. Okay. Structural implement, okay, has the one special, it's a very special case. This is the most difficult part, type of implement to deal with. Okay. Structural implement. Okay, it's a very special case. And why is it special? Because this is the most difficult type of uh, implement to deal with as a government. 
Okay, let's find out the reason and then you can see why it is so difficult to deal with this type of implement. So the key word to understand the structure implement is called a mismatch. You see an actor and it was highlight this one. Is it look called mismatch? Okay, what, what is the mismatch? There is a mismatch between the skills you have as a job thinker and there's a skill like the and and the requirement by the employers like the skills the working skills you have okay so now uh, uh, aren't those skills required by your potential employers and usually this mismatch is due to is caused by the technological change technological advancement. Now let's have an example, like 10 years ago, if I worked as a content, so what are contents do? They just do some kind of a sample group campaigns. Okay, so 10 years ago, I worked as a content, I just do book campaigns for my, for a company every day. But nowadays in recent years, maybe, 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 maybe next year, maybe next three, five years, let's, let's, let's predict, maybe, Maybe chat GPT also can do book campaign. Right. It is a reasonable to accept. Chat GPT can do like a lot of things. Like a like view replace some uh, some uh, some some human resources assembly. You see a lot of the people, a lot of the people will lost their job. Last such job due to due to the development of the AI, due to the development of the chat GPT, whatever the, the technique is called. So this is kind of things called a structure implement. Then I then can understand like why this is the most difficult type of implement to do with because if you want to as a government, if you want to like align those people want to find a new job, you need to give them more trainings. You okay? need to give some offer some career training programs, like re-education programs for these kind of people. So the re-education time and career training, so this kind of thing, kind of is very time consuming, right? You cannot learn something like new working skills in just in two or three days. You may be consumed like that one year, two years, maybe. Okay, so it is a take longer term to deal with this type of implement. Okay, so that is uh, so that is why this case is very special. So next one is called the seasonal implement. Seasonal implement is due to the, the reason just because of the time of the year. So usually seasonal implement occurred in the agricultural sector. So if I'm working as a fisherman, so maybe as a fisherman living working in Canada, so maybe during summertime, I'm not quite sure, but I guess maybe during summertime you can do the fishing. Okay, maybe during the winter time, especially you live in the east, the eastern part of the Canada, but right? during winter time, I guess it, you cannot do the fishing due to the due to the cold winter temperature, whatever the reason is. Okay, so this is kind of things called the season and match. So in real life in practice, so government really don't care much about season implement. Cause 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 just about the timing, right? So like kind of like the after after the winter time, so during summer time, so so, so fishermen so really can they, 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 they can find a find, find, find a find a fisher job yeah, during summer time. So we don't care the much. Uh, don't worry about them very much. So next one is called the cyclic implement. So cyclic implement is a card is a have some relationship is a uh, a visit term called the business circle. So in notes number two, just later we will talk about what is a business circle. Okay, but the second commandment, remember this, you lost your job, you cannot find a job. It's not due to your fault. 
It is not your fault. It is due to the bad macro environment. That is due to the overall war economy. Okay, so if there is an ongoing financial big economic crisis like due to COVID-19, so if you guys have heard about this due to 2008, like the great financial crisis, okay, we, we will also learn in 1929, is a, is a, so maybe maybe you guys have learned about this in the your social study class, is a kind of the Great Depression. Great, so due to the the, 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 the big environment, macro environment is not very good, is it? Because due to COVID-19, due to the war between Russia and Ukraine. So due to this kind of thing, okay, you lost your job. So this is kind of cyclical claim that. Okay, so once again, it's not due to your fault. Okay, it's not your fault, is it? Is it just because of the big environment is too bad? Okay, everybody lost their job. But just like COVID. Okay, next one is called a fractional implement. Okay, fractional implement is a key word, okay, to help you guys to understand is it called the between jobs. Okay, the key word really is a between jobs. So if you remember between jobs, like you quit, you quit the, your, your previous job. You had a job. Now you don't have a job, but you have one. It's just a quick that one to, to in order to find a new job. So the kind of this transition period between these two positions is how I'm going to the bathroom. I will be back quickly. Okay. Is a kind of fraction that we met. I'm back. Okay, let's continue. Uh, fractional implement. Okay, what are we are doing? Is so, fractional implement. Fractional implement is a is a kind of between jobs. You had a job, now you don't have one, but you had one. 
So why you quit that one? You wanted to like quit that one in order to find a new job. So it's a kind of the transitional repair where between your old job and a new position is a kind of fraction implement. Okay, that's it. So this is about fraction implement. So among so one different thing, so one special thing is that among these far different types of, of implement, generally speaking, I have mentioned implement is a bad thing, right? If you really don't have a job, if you you cannot make any money, if you cannot make money, how you can buy something, how you can consume something. Okay, but what we want to do in microeconomic, we want to promote more consumption activities okay, to increase your utility. Okay, so without employment, you cannot find a job, you cannot make money. Generally speaking, this is a really, really bad thing. Okay, but among five different types of employment, actually it's a one type of employment. One of them actually is a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a kind of a good for long-run economic growth. So which one? The answer is the last one. Okay, fraction implement kind of is a good thing. Okay, kind of is a good thing. Because in microeconomics, we already learned, we learned something, already learned something, cover something in microeconomics is about labor market. So in labor market, right, so, so from the economic view, okay, based on economic view, why people want to find a new job? Why you quit the previous one, you want to find a new job? Maybe you want to then enter into another industry. For example, your job was like you work as a like what you do like a like you work work as a content. Yeah maybe 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 now you want to work as a computer program as a software engineer engineering whatever like why you want to do this kind of transition. Why you want to enter in another industry? Or why you like uh, you even live in Cuba, you go to Toronto, you go to New York City, okay, to find a new job and be in financial industry. Why you do that? Super easy, right? You want to make more money. That's it. You want to make more money. And it, and it, what we learned in microeconomics, so why? Will you find a new position when you want to uh why, why you find it after you got, got you find a new job where you can make more money? The money you can make really depends on the money you can make for the for the company. Like in macroeconomics, we learned marginal factor cost. Okay, equals to MRP. Okay. Why you can why when you enter another industry, why you make more money, like why you MFC, by the which is increasing? The fundamental reason is you can make more money for, for the new company. So so why is this the case? Okay, so due to is due to actually your working efficiency is increasing. Okay, you quit the previous job, you find a new one, like a white as a new position, like your working efficiency is increasing because of the suitability, because of the suitability is increasing. Because the new position is more suitable for your like a personal educational background. Okay, so when you when you find a new job, you can work more effectively. You feel working efficiency increasing. So that means that that means the marginal production is increasing. Okay, marginal production is increasing. So MRP increases. So which is so the marginal factor cost increases. Okay, so. Yeah, if you can go through this uh, transitional period, okay, if you really can find a new job, if you can find a job, find a position, find a company where you can utilize all your working skills, you learn from school, you learn from college, university. Yeah, if uh, you can be more effective, 
this that is a good for our economic growth. If every society member, if all the Canadians, okay, really can find a job, really can really can find a position, okay, suitable, it is it, it's, it's more suitable for their education back, uh, technological background, educational background, then our overall society will be more effective. That is a really, really good thing. Okay, if our overall society is more effective, productive, okay, then the lower economic growth will increase. Okay, that is a reason like why fraction employment is a good thing. Okay, so kind of a base, so because of these, okay, because of these, remember this is the goal of a policy, the goal of our macro policy. Okay, it's not to lower the employment rate down to the zero percent. No, we don't want to do this. Okay, we don't need to, let's repeat again, we don't need to as a government, we don't need to lower the employment rate down to zero percent. We don't need to do that. Okay, instead of zero percent, what we want, what we want is called a natural rate of employment. Okay, natural rate of, of implement also can be called as a full implement rate. You just kind of need memorize these two terms. I need to know these two terms actually is the same thing. Okay, and then in some old fashioned textbook, natural rate of implement also can be called as a non accelerating information rate of implement. But, uh, but this term actually kind of is too long and uh, you can you can ignore this one. Okay, you can ignore this one, but you need to memorize the first two. Okay, natural rate of implement also can be called as a flat amount. It can be more specific. It's around around four to five percent. Okay, so we want to also the policy goal of a macroeconomic policy is the natural rate of implement. We want to take. Okay, we want to lower the implement rate. It's around four percent. Okay, but we don't need to lower the employment rate down to 0%. Okay, we don't need to do that. We kind of leave some room for the fractional employed workers. Okay, we just allow some time to let them to find a new job. And you know that if they, has, if they, has, if they can be successful, that is really, really good. It's a good for our economic growth. Okay, so we just leave some room here, okay, roughly 4%, for the mainly for the fraction implement. Okay, so last two term, maybe now you you cannot kind of fully understand the last two term, but for this moment, okay, just a few things the last two blanks, and uh, when we finish those number two, I guess you guys can better understand what we did here for the last two blanks. But now for this moment, just to finish, okay, just a few things is plan for this moment. So when the natural rate, uh, when the actual payment rate is the is the natural rate of payment, okay, I'm talking about when the actual rate roughly is a four percent. Okay, then we see currently there is no cyclical implement. Why is that? Why is it the case? Why there is no cyclic implement? Because we think okay, the current GDP roughly equal to the potential GDP in a country. And then you haven't learned about potential GDP once again. Okay, when we finish number two, okay, then you understand this point. Okay, so this is uh, the third part, I guess, is a kind of easier stuff, uh, just the two formulas and the five different types of implement. Yeah, basically, let's say, uh, let's do one practical question. So let's say, uh, Go and find the all the all your macroeconomic questions. Let's go to 2019. Question three. 
I remember there's a question asking you guys how to calculate the number of rate. And the labor force participation rate. Little bit of calculation. Okay, little bit, just do little bit of calculation. Okay, so five minutes, a little bit, let's do questions.
finish. Uh, question number A. Question number A is uh, intro and little graph is a uh, PGC. Uh, yeah, PGC is super easy, super easy. Kind of you just uh, need a first step, you need to need an XR plan. And uh, you need to really, we take the real examination, you really need to be careful. You just uh, carefully read the question to follow the requirement. I don't really know. I think your first week, in the first week of your microeconomics, we learn. We learn. We learn how to learn, how to join PPC. Okay? PPC just is a graph. Just is a graph representing your maximized production capability. Okay, but to draw this graph, we made a very important assumption. Okay, to simplify the question. Okay, we just assume, because we just have a x axis and a y axis, just the horizontal line and a vertical line. So we just made a simplification saying that, oh, in your country, we only can produce two different things. Okay, just two different things. Like in this question, like when you put oh we don't need to drop PPC actually. We don't need to drop PPC, sorry, we don't need to drop PPC. We just do a calculation to compare who has a comparative one page. This was the first step because we're going to calculate the opportunity costs. Of because the question asks you which country has a comparative advantage in the producing consumer goods. Okay, so opportunity cost of a consumer good in country X. Okay, equals to. Okay, because the information we got from this question. Actually, like a input table, right? Input table is not an output table. Because all those information, because all those numbers you got from the question, like it takes one hour, like people in country X, it takes one hour to produce a universal customer good, two hours. You see, one hour to two hours, okay, isn't about how many units you can produce, okay? It's about how many units kind of the human resources you need to input in order to do the production. Okay, because we, so we need to treat the question as an input table. So how you really consider is, oh, in country X, okay, people work one hour to produce a consumer good, two hour to produce a unit capital goods, so, so the opportunity cost for producing, so how you consider, how you calculate what is opportunity cost of that, producing consumer good. So you just think about, oh, if you, if you will not put this one hour for producing consumer good, what else you can do? Because I already mentioned, okay, your country only can do two things. You only can produce two things. If you don't want to produce the consumer goods, and another thing you can do is call the capital. Is it called capital goods? Okay, so if you don't, if you will not put this whatever for producing consumer good, then you must like put this whatever into the capital good industry. What, what so, so how many units of capital goods you can produce? So you just do one divided by two. You just one divided by two, so crazy. So you need some uh, capital goods. Okay, you just do same thing. You just uh, you are fairly all the same, but for country one. So what has those two numbers you got from country one? So two hours to produce a consumer goods, or four hours to produce you know, capital goods. 
So just like the first one, we do two divided by four. Okay, so very special. You you so two divided by four is three. Is three is equals to one divided by two. So this this question is very special. So country X and country Y they have same level of opportunity cost for producing customer goods. Okay, so the finally the answer is neither country has a comparative in production of customer goods. Okay, lower opportunity cost means you have a comparative advantage. Okay, but if you have a same level of a comparative advantage compared with your trading partner, then we can see neither country. Okay, don't do both country, but do neither country has comparative advantage. Neither, okay, neither. Instead of those, we see neither country as a comparative advantage in producing companies. B and C totally is a, totally is a related, relevant to the, today's lecture. So number B is on the top right. So how we can turn it on the right? So what we mentioned, this are the formula we learned today equals to unemployed workers. So where is where are those unemployed workers? You got three numbers, right? So first number is called ten thousand dollars, ten thousand, and the second second one is a five. Okay, the third one is. Uh, Okay, this is three groups. This is three categories of unemployed workers. The person that gather add them together is the member of the code for unemployed workers. Is that right? Okay, so divided by labor force. So be very, very careful. The denominator here is called the labor force. It's not the total population. So 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 there is the total labor force. So basically, you need to add up all those first four numbers together. Okay, and paid workers for sure is a part of the labor force. Okay, so put all this together. So you do the calculation. I guess it's the ten percent. Okay, so this is the answer for question B. Okay, the first preference is uh, the total on employed workers. Okay, what I did here in the first open prime. Is just uh, add these three numbers together ten thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, and then another five thousand dollars. And this is called the total on employed workers. Okay, in the second preference that I did here, I just add up those four numbers together. Okay, first of four rows, four numbers together. So this is a count of the total labor force. And there's a count of the total labor force. Okay, labor force includes those people who currently is being employed and who currently is unemployed but actively seeking employment. And maybe once again, if you don't have a job and you don't actively thinking implement, then you cannot be called as a part of a labor force. So number C, labor force participation rate. Okay, so this one is a total um, labor force over the population. They will mention the, the first of four numbers together, put them together as a labor force. And uh, there is the total population size. The total population size is basically all the numbers. 
Okay, so first is the sum of the first of four numbers divided by the total population size. I guess as a finding answer is it should be two third. Two third to me. Okay. Oh, the last one, the last one we need to join PPC. Okay, instead of the first question, the last question we join PPC. And we mentioned the PPC, okay, AC graph, okay, it's a graph. The PPC just is this curve, okay, just is this line here is called PPC. And the PPC, okay, is a line representing the maximum of production capability in your country. Maximum production capability in your country. Okay, and the graph to make this graph made it two very uh, a very important assumption. Like assuming we only can produce two different things. Okay, one is called the consumer good, and another one is called the capital. Okay, so we you to what I mentioned, you need to carefully, you need to read the, carefully read the question. Read the question to follow the requirements. Okay, you need to put the consumer goods on the horizontal axis. So you label the horizontal line by Q of the consumer goods. Okay, this one is called the Q of capital goods. And what we learned earlier in the first week, week number one, is we said we learned okay if a production point, if a production point lies on PPC. So every point, every point, if I just plot a point here, every point I could I could add on into this XY plane represent a production count combination. Okay, represent a combination of two different things I could produce, right? Okay, so if I put, if I plot a point here, so that means, oh, I produce this much of a consumer goods, this much of a capital goods, and so on, and so on, and so on. Okay, every point in this XY plane represent a combination of a two different things I can produce. And a production point cannot be beyond the PPC, okay, like the line here is called the PPC. Okay, a production point cannot be all the side of the PPC. Like this one, in practice, in real life, is not impossible. Okay, because in, cause in field of economics, we have one, like a very, very fundamental assumption is everybody including country, regardless of who you are. You can be individual, you can be government, you can be a country. Everybody has a limited resources on hand. Okay, so you can produce like that much. Okay, already beyond the maximum level we can produce. Okay, given the resource endowment available in our country. Okay, and the next step if a production point lies production point lies on PPC, like exactly on this PPC on this line. Okay, that means you can produce, but you already reach to your maximum potential. Okay, that is already the highest level. Okay, indicating you already used up all the resources with nothing left, with no resources left. You use all your resources and the best technology. Okay, but uh, what is the case for this country? Okay, the information we got, the information, the calculation we did for B and C, especially for B, indicating that, oh, the country didn't utilize all their human resources, right? Because the unemployment rate actually is quite high. It's 10%. It's a ten percent is a very is a pretty high employment rate, so that means your country you don't use 
you don't use, right? You don't utilize all the human resources that you have. So in that case, we are doing something called the ineffective production. So actually the right answer for this one should be production point inside of BBC. Anywhere, you just plug in your point anywhere inside of BBC, you can get full mark and you need to label this one by Z. Anywhere inside the PPC is okay. Is a totally fine. Okay, but you cannot plot your point like beyond the PPC on the PPC. Is this a two wrong cases? Okay, but you need to plot your point inside the PPC anywhere as long as inside of this PPC. So you can label this by this one by Z. Okay, once again, because you don't utilize all the resources. If you did, if you ut use all the resources, utilize all the resources you have, okay, then the production point should be less on PPC. But for this case, once again, okay, it should be inside the BBC. Okay, so this is a practical question for your notes number one. Uh, the second half lecture, let's move on to like notes number two. Oh, this is some tall here is in the And to change this one to everybody in the meeting. Okay, everybody in the meeting. So in notes number two, okay, what we are doing in notes number two is to build a model. Okay, so to build a model, microeconomics model, they call the AICD model. AICD model is the is a, like the title here is called the aggregate supply and aggregate demand model. Okay, for short, it can be called the AICD model. So quite pretty much is a kind of a very similar compared with the supply and the demand model in your microeconomics. Kind of the kind of the fundamental idea. Okay, of these two models is pretty much the same thing. Okay, but it just some differences. It just there are some differences between the micro and the macro model. So I will go all these differences in, in later section. But uh, okay, but the first is that make sure you guys make sure you guys have one uh, have a copy on your hand. But first step, we want to talk about, I want to talk about what is the reason, okay? What is the goal? What is the goal of building this specific model, the color ASAD model? Like you know, number one, we learned how we calculate GDP, right? Like we learned a two specific way. Okay, one is called the expenditure approach and another one is the income approach. We kind of learned Cover so many things about how to calculate GDP, estimate GDP, measure GDP, and whatever the term we want to use. Okay, so we use those uh, approaches. Okay, we okay, like, like how to calculate GDP. If we use all those methods, we learn from those number one. If we actually do that calculation, if we actually do the measurement, we call this a graph. Okay, we call this a graph. Imagine the country here is called the USA, and we use the horizontal line. The horizontal axis actually is a timeline. Okay, the starting point here, okay, the left end is the starting point of this timeline, kind of is after the Second World War. And the Y axis here you can see representing the real GDP. And the black is a flat, this is a street, 
lie here representing the average GDP growth rate. Okay, average GDP grosses like by this line representing by this line. Okay, gross. Right. Okay, the real data, okay, the real data I can tell you guys is a 2%. Okay, it's a 2%. Okay, for those are Western, the major economy in Western, those are Western countries, okay, like USA, Canada, Germany, UK. Okay, after actually in recent, like four to five decades, their GDP growth rate is pretty low, roughly is 2%, roughly is 2%. Compared with this, West major economies, actually Asia countries, right? Especially East Asia countries, right? In past 20 years, 30 years, actually, uh, zero GDP growth rate is, is very high. Okay, it's so faster than the Western countries. Okay, like between 2000 and 2010, a good, like China's GDP growth rate in terms of nominal rate is, is kind of very fast. It's, 10%, average speaking, 10%. Okay, 10%. Okay, so Chinese overall economics are growing, was growing very fast, okay, during that 10 years. Roughly speaking, between 2000, between 2000 and 2010. We had the, the, the flyers are growing in rate among, among, among the countries. Okay, but the comparison that, okay, all those industrial the countries, okay, developed countries, again, average speaking, their, their GDP growth rate kind of is so low. Okay, let's see 2%. But the one major thing, one, one of the term I use here is called the average. Yeah, I guess you guys can understand what is called the average rate. The long-term average rate is 2%, okay, over this long time interval, right? Average speaking, the GDP increases 2% every year over a very long time period, like after the Second World War until today. roughly 80 years, right? Roughly 80 years, 90 years. Okay, it's a very long time here, weird. Okay, but the real rate, but the real increase rate for each year does not necessarily equal to 2%, right? Right? Because the 2% is a kind of average growth rate. Okay, so for each and every year, so maybe during some time, so you see the GDP is increasing. All we can see the increasing rate is higher than 2%. All we can see the GDP is increasing. Okay, like these years. Okay, like these years. You see GDP is increasing. All we can see the increasing rate, growth rate is higher than 2%. Okay, but some for some other years, yeah, I changed another color in blue. You see, okay, GDP kind of decreasing. All we can see the increasing rate is lower than two percent. So, you see some so-called fluctuations in aggregate economic activities, right? Fluctuations, ups and downs, ups and downs. Okay, roughly, roughly all the countries, okay, all the countries experience these fluctuations. Okay, no one can grow their economy just like this street line, like 2% every year, 2% every year, 2% every year. We always have these fluctuations. In the field of macroeconomy, okay, this is a very important phenomenon as a kind of business cycle. Okay, we call this overall, we call this fluctuations. As a business circle. Okay, business circle. So in this graph, we actually have two business circles. Because of one business circle, simply speaking, loosely speaking, equals to one expansion plus another recession. 
Okay, what is called the expansion? Expansion, expansionary time. Okay, super easy. It's, a, it's a when the GDP increases, like here. Okay, like when GDP increases. Okay, two expansions. And after this, is a two expansionary time. Okay, followed by two recessionary time. Recession means when GDP decreases. Is it called recession? Okay, one expansion and then another recession put them together. Is have a first business cycle here. So this is a second business cycle. Okay, so in this graph, we total have two business cycles. Okay, number three. Remember this, okay? Business cycle. How long is a business cycle really depends on the real data that collected from the real business world. Okay, no human beings, no economists, no human beings can regulate like how long is a business cycle. Okay, so totally depends on the real data. Totally depends on the real data. So totally depends on the like we are measuring the real world. We are not regulating something here. Okay. So so this is business circles. This is things that totally like a recurrent. Okay. So that means we don't have a like a uniform schedule. We don't regulate. We don't make a table. Okay. Seeing one business circle must be three years or five years or ten years. No. They don't have a session table schedule regulation. Okay, so it totally depends on the real data that collected. Okay, so this is saying says the fluctuations once again, or speaking the color business and so called. And we must, all the countries, always we need to experience this, this, uh, this fluctuations. But back to 1930s, okay, back to 1930s, yeah, roughly 100 years ago, okay, back to then, okay, no economist knew what is actually the reason why we have these business circles. Okay, back to then, back to 1930s, okay, people think like uh, we, Want to what we want to have is this a straight line kind of we want to grow several economy okay just like this a straight line like a very stable like a two percent every year two percent every year we actually don't want these big fluctuations hopefully you can understand the flash with big fluctuations kind of is a bad thing. Businesses are kind of is a bad thing, especially if you have big, extreme fluctuations. Why is the case? Okay, try to understand this. Big fluctuations. Okay, bring something out. Bring something out is 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 called the uncertainty. Big fluctuations means uncertainty. And the human beings, we are human beings, and human beings in the field of economics, we don't like uncertainty. Instead of uncertainty, we like, we prefer something called certainty in the field of economics. Okay, let's have an example here. Okay, what is a kind of certainty? Certainty kind of is a kind of a peace in your mind. We like some, that kind of a feeling. Okay, if you do something and you have a kind of like a piece, piece, piece in your mind. Okay, for example, if I want to, if I want to invest my money to have me to run in my own business. Okay, once again, let's imagine my own business is called my bubble tea store. Okay, if I want to run my bubble tea store in Vancouver, I like something called a certainty. If if a God talk if 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 the God tells me oh that's okay that's totally fine you just invest your money let's see ten thousand dollars okay your business revenue your customers will 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 grow like by two percent every year 
if someone can tell me this, oh, well, I could be very happy. Right? You, you, you have peace in your mind. Like, like your business, your business around you, your customer, whatever the term you want to use, will you increase by 2% every year. You see, this is called a certainty. Yeah, with the kind of this kind, with this kind of a certainty, we could be very happy. You don't, you don't, you don't need to worry about anything, right? This is a called certainty. But the big fluctuations, but the, but this is not the real life. Is this is not the real case? The real life, okay, is the world of uncertainty. Okay, for some years, for some good years, make, you can make a lot of money. Your business revenue increases, increases. You got more and more customers, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but for some other years, okay, when travels, when travels come, okay, due to COVID-19, due to the war between Russia and Ukraine, Okay, due to some political, like, like a blah, blah, a lot of factors. You see your business is declining here. So this is a real love. Okay, some years is good, some years is bad. So these are fluctuations, once again, the kind of business is a call. And we don't like for sure, based on this little story here, we don't like this sense, we don't like Ups and downs, right? We want to we want to try our best to stabilize the world we live in. We try to stabilize our macroeconomic system. We try to stabilize for you specifically. You try to stabilize your bubble tea store business. Okay, so one goal of a macroeconomic policy is we don't like these big fluctuations. And then what we want to do is smooth out, smooth out this business circles. Okay, if a big fluctuations bring out something called uncertainty, if we can smooth out the business circles a little bit, we cannot animate, okay? We cannot animate our business circles, but we want to smooth out, okay? We we don't have a big fluctuations. Okay, we try our best to smooth out the fluctuations. Okay, we 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 we, we try to produce some something called certainty. Okay, we try to decrease the level of uncertainty. Okay, is actually what we want to do. What we what you need to do in the macroeconomics. Okay, but the first step to smooth out the business cycle. Okay, is to try to understand. Okay, people try to understand. Like in nineteen thirties, all all the economists say during that age. Okay, try to understand what are those reasons. Okay, what are those reasons why we had these big fluctuations. What is a real reason of a business cycle? Okay, that is a kind of a first research question. Okay, in the in the field of macroeconomics, everybody everybody want to figure out okay what has also real reasons. Okay, but uh, regarding this question, kind of a different different people have a different idea. Simply speaking, loosely speaking, okay, different people have different ideas. Okay, the first group, okay, the first group, you guys may heard about this, okay, in the development of a macroeconomics idea, we have, we have something called a different school of a source, different school of a source, professional speaking, different school of a source. So what is a school of a source? So basically, it had different group of macroeconomics. Okay, we distinguish this macroeconomics based on their kind of ideology. Okay, and a different group have a different macroeconomists. They have different idea. Okay, they have different understanding. Okay, regarding about what are those reasons of the business account. Okay, so the first 
group of macroeconomists we call them a classical theory, classical economists. Okay, the, the, uh, the, their ideology is simply speaking can be called as a classical theory. Okay, before 1930s, okay, those are early ideas before 1930s. Okay, they're called the classical theory. And the one central idea, and the one central idea of the classical theory is this, is it called the CIS law. Okay, it's called CIS law. So, if I just use a one sentence, okay, CIS law okay, is, okay, CIS, uh, is about this. Is it, supply creates its own demand. Okay, the shortest version of CIS law. Okay, just this sentence. Supply can create, supply can create its own demand. So what do I mean by this? So supply create on demand. So if something, either goods or services that can be produced in your country, if some production activities can be occurred in your country, then this production activity really can generate, really can bring out incomes earned by all the people who involved in this production process. And ultimately, the ultimate goal of making money, if you, if we are human beings, the ultimately the goal of making money is to spend them. So when you make money, finally you will spend them. By seeing this, okay, classical theory, classical economists, they want to prove something that supply always equal to demand. Supply creates demand. Supply creates demand, and the demand in turn will always equal to supply curve. This is a kind of cis law. This is a kind of classical concept. Okay, so finally, as a result, okay, like uh, in macroeconomics, we learned like a supply demand side. Okay, there are two sides. The supply side is the producer, demand side is the consumer. So based on classical theory, okay, if all these things are right, based on classical theory, kind of we don't need to care much more about demand side of the market. Okay, supply side based on economic theory is one important thing. As long as we can supply something, produce something, okay, then the GDP will increase. Okay, so so supply, so supply is the kind of the solely is the determinant of the GDP. And in long run, and in long run, okay, over a very long period of time, okay, supply depends on these two factors, resource and technology. Okay, so let's repeat again. Long run GDP based on classical theory only depends on the supply. Only depends on the because the supply representing the production activity. Only depends on like how many things okay we produce within our country and how many things we can produce within our country in long run okay only determined by resource and technology. Okay, all depends on the supply side. Okay, kind of has no relationship with the demand curve. Okay, so maybe it's a very confusing. Let's have a very, very specific example here. So to explain like why supply can create demand. Okay, what do I mean by this? So last week, when we learned about income approach, we had an example, it's called toaster example. I still remember my toaster story. So if I'm a producer, imagine I'm a producer, I have my own factory plant to produce a toaster. So let's have an example, okay, by producing, by selling one more toaster, I can make $20. Remember that example, this example, $20. Right, but uh, I cannot make okay all of these twenty dollars as my profit. Right, I need to pay so many different kinds of uh, cost. Cost I need to buy resources. Cost 
a lot of people contributed their production factors into the production process. So I need to pay them money. Okay, so if I pay six dollars to workers because I hire so many workers, right? Because the uh, next step I pay three dollars to the supplier suppliers of raw materials. I pay just one dollar to my landlord because I'm renting a building for my factory. Okay, to simplify up, to simplify the question. Just as these three examples, I guess it's enough. Okay, the remaining ten dollars. I can make remaining $10 as my own profit, net profit. You see, by making this table, I kind of break down this overall, this $20, $20 into different numbers. Six, three, one, 10, and I add them together must be equal to 20. And all these numbers, actually are incomes made by different people. $6 is income made by workers, $3 is income made by, $3 is income made by the suppliers of who, who contributed the raw materials. $1 is the income earned by my landlord and the remaining $10 is the income earned by shareholders of the company. Everybody made money here, okay? Everybody made money here. Everybody made money here. Okay, and we, if we sum up, if we add up all the income earned by different people together, so the total income must be equal to the price of a toaster. This is a fundamental logic why we can use income approach to estimate, to estimate GDP. Okay, so back to our today's story is, okay, based on classical theory, the ultimately the goal of making money is to spend them, right? Everybody together made $20 here, then what, why? Why you want to make money? Ultimately, you want to spend them. You made twenty dollars. Yeah, it is better for you before you die. You need to spend all their all your twenty dollars to maximize your happiness. This is the classical theory. It is almost impossible. People don't spend their twenty dollars. Don't spend their income made from this production process. Okay, so based on classical theory. Okay, supply always equal to demand. Supply can create, supply can create demand and the demand will be always equal to supply. So to follow this logic, okay, we don't care more about the demand side of the, the whole market. We care more about supply. If we can produce, okay, people will consume. The GDP will increase for sure. And in the long run, okay, the supply only depends on resource and technology. This is called classical theory. Okay, but it turns out, finally, it turns out classical theory basically is wrong. It's a partially right, it's a partially wrong. Why? The, the real history proves that the classical theory has, at least it has some drawbacks, okay, because uh, uh, you guys may have learned about this. Okay, in 1922, something happened. Okay, something called the Great Depression happened. This is a this is the first major global financial crisis, economic crisis happening in the human beings in history. Simply speaking, during the 1930s, the overall GDP in USA has been is dec declined by quite a lot. Okay, so it's an economic crisis. But based on classical theory, right? Economy, GDP, overall economy, overall GDP kind of only depends on the supply curve and the supply curve only determined by resources and technology. So if a classical theory is wrong, okay, that means, so that means during the 1930s, right, the reason of a, of a, of a declined GDP 
either be declined resources, either be declined technology. Okay, but none of these two cases happen. Okay, kind of the real history proves that the classical theory at least has some drawbacks. So then my question, then a question for you guys, what is the problem here? Okay, what is the big mistake made by the classical theory economist? So let's carefully, let's re review a little bit about their logic they follow. I guess the first part of the classical theory is right. right? What is the first part? If something can be happen, if something can be produced, sorry. If something can be produced, if some production activities, some kind of business production, exchange, if some economic activities can be happening in your country, people can make money. So this part is a right for sure. Okay, but the next part, the next step actually is a problematic. Based on classical theory, you make $20, you made $20, you spend $20. So this step is the key problem. Okay, this is not quite right in real life. Okay, the problem and the question is, is it actually it's about the time span you are considering. Okay, classical theory is a kind of a too simple. Why? Because the time span considered by classical economists is a Professionally speaking, it's about a single time period. Single time period. Okay, if I see this, okay, we live as a human beings, so we live just once. So before you die, so before you die, you need to spend all the money you made. This is a kind of a right. This is a kind of right. If the time span you are considering is a kind of single time period, like you live once, like you made like a $1 million from your like a lifelong career, okay, it is better for you to spend if you want to maximize your own happiness before you die. <laughs> You need to spend all your one million dollars. Okay, this is a kind of a right. Okay, but this is a, but this is a, sometimes we are considering instead of this a very long run, right? Sometimes in real life we are kind of a care more about the kind of a short run. So the time span in more, more realistic cases, we are considering a multiple time periods of time. Usually, usually more, more normally, we are considering, oh, like I, I, I have been living in this world for 80 years, 90 years. You see, by seeing this, okay, instead of saying I only live once, okay, but instead of this, okay, if you say, okay, I live in this world, I live in Vancouver for 80 years. Have you spent my life here? Okay, so how long is your life? 80 years. You see, this is a big difference. Now you are considering a multiple time period. Okay, so if you are considering multiple time periods, okay, you will see. Okay, because we are human beings, you will you 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 will get get ret uh, retired from your job. Okay, you are in not a lifelong worker. You cannot make money every day. After you got retired, and I'm assuming okay, your income will stop, at least a decline quite a lot, by quite a lot. So how you respond to how you prepare the future retirement life, you must see 
part of your current income into your banking account to you do some savings for the future. You see, by seeing this, this is a big difference. By seeing this, by seeing this, we can prove that supply does not always equal to demand. If we are considering a multiple time period rare situation, okay, and the and the computer with the single time period real situation, the later case multiple time period is kind of the more realistic. Is a is a bit more closer to have a real life, and this is a major drawback. Okay, this is a major drawback, like made by the classical economic theory. Okay, the contributed their contribution is about is about explain the long run situation, long run economic growth phenomena. Okay, but the drawback of a classical theory, okay, is kind of the don't focus much more about the short run situation. Okay, if we are considering eighty years, ninety years, we are considered multiple. Uh, time here rears so like the time span we are considering is a shorter, so it's a kind of short run situation, short run cases. Okay, so more realistic series, more realistic series. This is a short run situation, short run cases. So we are explained by Keynesian economic theory. Okay, so to fully understand what is a Keynesian economic theory, so today we build a so-called ASCD model. So let's uh, directly, let's uh, go to the page number three here. So let's uh, build this. Okay, let's uh, build this uh, so-called ASCD model to well, to kind of make our uh, analyze a little more systematic Okay, we here we can distinguish. Okay, you uh, a long run analysis or short run analysis. Okay, this is how we represent a market system in macroeconomics. The fundamental idea just is the same thing compared with the microeconomics. Uh, but uh, one major difference between this market and the supply curve, demand curve, you learn in microeconomics is in micro, you are learning about a specific market. Okay, what do you mean by specific market? We build the supply demand model in microeconomics, and the supply demand model is a for is a market for a specific particular single market. Okay, either be a bubble tea market, apple market, banana market, whatever the product and services is trading here. Okay, but in macroeconomics, we are learning the whole society, the whole country, the whole, the entire macroeconomic. Okay, so we no longer learn an individual market. So if we need to add a title for this market, we label this country by a by a country's name. Okay, if you are studying learning about USA, we just uh, label this one by USA. Okay, this is a really the fundamental difference between ASCD model and the supply and demand curve model. Once again, microeconomics is about the individual market. Okay, either be bubble tea market, market, banana market. Okay, but the macroeconomic is no longer an individual product. Okay, it's no longer it's no longer about a particular services we produce here in Vancouver. Okay, but it's about the national economic system. We already include all the things, just like how we calculate GDP, we include all the things, either goods or services produced here within Canada into this graph, into this system. Another difference is in this 
model, okay, we got three curves. Instead of two, we got a three here, okay, because we have two different versions of a supply curve. We call this one as a long, long AS. Okay, we call this one by short, long AS. The demand curve is more, it's, it's easier, it's more friendly. Okay? We only have one AD, it's called average demand curve. Traditionally, in your macroeconomics, we label the horizontal by Q, but uh, we already mentioned, okay, the market no longer is a particular single uh, product. Okay, we already include everything produced here in Canada into this graph. So in the first chapter of the macroeconomics, we already know we use something called the real GDP for measuring the total production level. So we label the horizontal flyby by real GDP. And this one is a price level. It's a called price level. We must write down the whole thing, okay, price level. In macroeconomics, you no longer can label the y-axis just by uppercase letter P. Uppercase letter P, like what we did for macroeconomics, once again, the price for a single particular product or service. Okay, but in macroeconomics, once again, we are learning like the, what we did in the chapter one, like what we learned from the inflation rate. We care more, we study, we learn about the overall, the general price level of everything traded in our country. So it's the average price level, general price level. So we must write down here by price level. Okay, but, but no longer an individual price. Okay, the first curve is, uh, let's go through them one by one. Okay, the first one is called the long run AS. Okay, the aggregate supply curve from a long run perspective. So long run AS, and it's a vertical curve. So based on classical theory, okay, I didn't see classical theory is so totally wrong. What has that is a classical theory. Kind of they are good at explaining the long run economic growth, long run phenomena. Okay, they got drawbacks. Their drawback is oh, they don't explain the short run fluctuations very well. Okay, but they are kind of good at explaining the long run economic growth, so the long run thing. Okay, and uh, based on their Siri, <laughs> okay, long run economic growth depends on only two factors resource and the technology. Resource and the technology. So, long run economic growth, okay, historic speaking, okay, historic speaking, only a very long time here, rates. Okay, whether your country can make can grow the economy, okay, only determined by resources and company. And that's a totally right, right? That's a totally right. Okay, so, so it has a no relationship with the short from short from price of fluctuation. Okay, you only determined by resource and technology. So it has a no relationship with the price of fluctuation, price level. Mm -hmm. So you see long run AS is a totally vertical curve. So that means has a no relationship with the value. And the intersection here is called a potential GDP. We label this one by YF. It's called a potential GDP. How big is the potential GDP? Once again, only determined by resource and technology. So it has no relationship with the price level. You see, price level can be very high, it can be in the middle, it can be very low but it cannot change the position of YF. YF is a fixer here. Okay, so it has no relationship with the price level. Okay, but short run AS, okay, it's a positive sloping curve. Okay, it's a positive sloping curve over a shorter period of time. Instead of talking about the kind of the long history. Okay, if we are talking about, we are discussing more short run situation. 
Okay, the aggregate supply curves do just like in microeconomics is a is a is a is a micro is a positive sloping curve. Generally speaking, generally speaking, why is it positive? Because the producers naturally they want to make more money, right? Simply speaking, or they want to make more money. Simply speaking, they want to make a moment. So, so if the in the short run, if a price level increases, or all the producers will produce more things. Okay, because they want to make money. We learned we carry this from macroeconomics. AD is about the demand side, it's about consumers. So the consumers so you can so naturally you can easily understand. Yeah. So AD is a downward downward sloping curve. So when price level decreases, the general price decrease decreases. Yeah, uh, generally speaking, consumers are willing to buy more things. Okay, so this is an inversely related relationship. So AD is a downward sloping curve. It is an intersection of all three curves here in macroeconomics is called a long, long equilibrium. Okay, so we can label the long run equilibrium is the intersection of all three curves as a as a E here. And uh, once again, what F is called a potential GDP. So I can write down. This is called a potential GDP. Okay, potential GDP kind of is a maximum of production ability. Just like today we talk about, we reviewed about PPC, right? So PPC, so potential GDP is a maximum of, it's a graphical, PPC is a graphical. It's a way to represent potential GDP. Maximize the production ability. And we mentioned it so many times. So, so this variable determined by resources, how many resources you have in your country and the technology. Just a few. Okay, so has a no relationship, only has a, this is only has a relationship with these two things. So it has a no relationship with uh, potential price level. Okay, so long run as is a vertical line. Okay, so you can view all these subjects. Okay, so so we have what what, what we have done here. So we explained, we talked about, we discussed everything about the long run AS. Okay, but today we just briefly uh discussed like a why short run AS is a positively sloping. Like the reason I explained is oh producers based on your macroeconomics, the producers want to make more money. So if the general price level increases, you want to produce some more. Okay, this is a high explained like why short run AS is a positive sloping. But this is not enough. Okay, not enough. I guess I don't have enough time to cover to dig deep here regarding the reasons, like a more serious explain why short run AS is a positive sloping. But have you do this, I guess, next week? Okay, but for this week, just remember, okay, if producers, they want to make more money, right? When the general price level increases, they should supply more, produce more, sell more to make more money. And the demand curve representing the consumers. So when general price level decreases, yeah, people buy more. As a consumer, so consumers want to save your money. So when price level decreases, they are willing to buy more. But this is a, once again, like a, 
for, for saving money, demand curves are down sloping. For making more money, so short term yes, is upper sloping. This is a kind of a too simplified explanation. Okay, once again, we will do, we will do this kind of next week. Okay, to more serious actually to more systematic explain like why short term yes and AD. Like why AS is a positive sloping curve and the demand curve is a downward sloping curve. But overall, finish the model. Okay, we build this model, and this one is called ASAD. That the next week, you will see how we use this model to explain. Don't forget the goal of building this model. We want to explain, we want to model the behavior of overall economy. Okay, we use this data graph this model here to explain like why some years GDP can be increased, why some years the GDP is a decline. Now this kind of stuff. So let's see what kind of a question we can do this way. Okay, this week, I guess we can practice some more questions uh, for calculating the inflation rate, I guess. Okay, the first question, The first question is um, here two thirty eleven from B. Okay, two thirty eleven from B. Two thirty eleven from B. Use red. Okay, it's about inflation, right? And the next one, one the two questions. Okay, one more question about GDP is a two thirty eight questions, right? Seven eight. Two seven eight also for B questions right. Okay, two gratitude response. It's your homework this week. And the new questions is you in the next one. Questions, chat box.